Yes. Right. I'll take a ham. Well, I mean, it's a holiday, and I think it's very important that we have a ham for a holiday, and uh, I will be serving at least 12. Well, they wanted to have tacos, but I mean, this cosmopolitan kid. Oh, oh, hi. <laughs> I'll call you back. Hi, it's me, uh, MKD, and I want to thank you for tuning in and for watching and for sharing all the love that is auntie. That's right. We've got movers. We've got shakers. We've got motivators and entrepreneurs and today today is no different today is no different this classic diva i have known for a long time and when i tell you the moment i thought about doing a podcast i thought who will i have on immediately i thought of ambrosia salad Woo! hello are you there one ringy dingy. <laughs> I, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> One ringy dingy. I wonder if uh, now this is the kind of retro conversation we're going to be having here. <laughs> Do the kids today know what one ringy dingy means? Do you know what? I think the people that are watching this are not kids <laughs> or listening. <laughs> so they'll know that's a Lily Tomlin reference. Exactly. Oh, my God. Exactly. But the best thing about uh, Rock Fox Studios is that we've got modern technology. Look, you can still hear me and you can hang up this telephone but and you're all the wiser. It's so comfortable in my hand. I miss the old days where you had this big contraption to hold up. The <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll put it down. And then I'll be hands-free and safe to go. Hands-free and safe to go. Ambrosia salad looking lovely. Oh I'm so excited that you're here. Here we are. Springtime in Rochester. I, oh, my gosh. It is. It's just, you know, the Rochester weather, you can't predict. One minute it's going to be snow. Next thing, it's a blizzard. And then it's the, you know, the waves of Darien Lake come <laughs> crashing through. <laughs> so we've been having a great time. Inviting people in to chat, uh, people who have motivated me throughout the years, people who have kept me going. And I've got so many different things I want to talk to you about. But I like to start out, first and foremost, by letting everybody know, I don't know if they know this, but you're a drag queen. Well, yes. <laughs> and At tell least us, in my eyes. Is it, well, in mine, too. Uh, tell everybody a little bit of a story about a brief bio of how you got started in drag and what it means to you. Well, I mean, it's so hard to explain. I Just quickly, I, I started coming out to the uh, clubs in Rochester when I was a senior in high school. Right. We were very rebellious. We <laughs> left the safe suburbs of Canandaigua. We got in the car and we came up to the clubs in Rochester. And we were so young back then, we thought, you know, showing up at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock was the appropriate time to go out. Right. But uh, I quickly learned it was not. But anyway, I remember... Um, because I was in the high school marching band and I was in the color guard and, um, you know, we did a little bit more of the theatrics back then. And uh, I saw my first drag show and I was immediately drawn to it. Um, there was just the mystique and aura uh, about their presence and their personality that kind of commanded attention. Do you remember who those queens were or kings? Uh, yeah, I definitely remember a couple of my favorites when I first started coming out were... Uh, Morgan was one of them, Jamie Blue, Aggie Dune, um, one of my favorites, uh, just because of her name alone, was Chihuahua Holiday. <laughs> I thought, well, yeah. that is God's gift to uh, names. Right. So... And yeah. so, yeah. And so these queens are out there impressing you. Now, you said you were a color guard. I'm assuming uh, maybe a little bit of a flamboyant boy as a little boy, girl, gal, girl, boy, fella. <laughs> Well, this is a little known secret, but I'll share this. And when we did the um, being in band and color guard, we had our own awards ceremony at the end of the year. And uh, my senior year, I won the award least likely to remain a male. Oh, <laughs> so wow! Anyway, they were calling you out right then there. Uh, you know, where now were you out in high school? Uh, I had come out. Yes, to some close friends, not completely. Right. I don't know why I waited. You know. If I could tell myself, my younger self, you know, hindsight 2020, you know, be yourself, be your right. authentic self. Why lie about who you are to these strangers who you don't care about? You know, well, it was a different time. It was a different time. It was a different time. Safety. And it was about safety. It was about, uh, you know, protecting yourself. And you were, I, I personally wasn't sure how my family would react. They didn't react great right. when I finally did. So, 
you know, I think things like this podcast and RuPaul's Drag Race and and the is internet the way it is today, they are all little nudges for representation for people. Right. So, but what what was the representation for you back then? Like, so you're out. Who were the 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 people that you'd see on either TV or that like you started to connect to and find that community or which drag queens were like kind of pulling at your, you know, creative loins as it were. Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, it, it is hard because there wasn't much representation. There were those occasional characters on TV shows. Dynasty had one gay character. Maybe yeah. it was Dallas. I can't remember. Uh, I remember Melrose Place had their gay kiss, uh, which was, you know, I don't even know if the camera actually had the two characters in the same screen. I don't even remember it anymore. But um, but I was big fans of Boy George, Annie Lennox, uh, you know, kind of that uh, cross-gender androgynous kind of right. thing that was going on. So I think Ambrosia Salad shows that, like, in, in terms of the character that you created. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like Kiss. I see I, Kiss. Yeah, I, I was a big Kiss fan growing up. And I don't even think it was necessarily the rock music. It was just the theatrics of the the costumes and right. the stage show. And, you know, it just happened to be a rock and roll band on top of it. But, yeah. Now, I know this, that when you were growing up, there were some posters on your wall. <laughs> <laughs> Any certain posters that you were proud of, or that maybe your dad was proud to see? Well, I I, I joke that you know you, you um you know there's always signs and indications that so I thought my dad would be uh, I joke that he was proud because I had all these women on my posters, but you know they were Dolly Parton, Donna Summer, Pointer Sisters, Madonna, you know Annie Lennox, right. Charlie's Angels, <laughs> Linda Carter. I have them all. I have them all, but uh, not necessarily because I wanted to be with them. I just wanted to be like them. <laughs> exactly. So. Well, and today when we visit your beautiful, humble abode, who's mm. on your wall? It's still carried over. I still have Dolly. I have Linda Carter. I, yeah. And oh Kiss, I think. Uh, well, I was just say, uh, you have the most gigantic, gorgeous mural <laughs> of Wonder Woman. Yes. Uh, and I think that, that there's something about the character of Ambrosia Salad that is like, you know, that superhero. Right. Drag, I think, is for all of us a way to be ourselves. And at least for me, I am more myself um, sometimes when I put on this armor. Yes. You know, and uh, I think uh, Ambrosia has this colorful, creative, like loving energy that comes from you. I, I mean, I remember when I first came out to the clubs, what at Mother's, what was really special is that we'd come to see you and you would host the shows and you were fun and you were funny and you were, but what was most special about Ambrosia Salad is that you were engaging with the crowd and if we gave you a tip, you would either mouth quickly, thank you, if you weren't lip syncing, or your hand would go like, doot, doot, like, thank you. And it was just so kind. I just yeah. felt the kindness coming. And we talk about the clubs and finding your tribe. Did you find your community and your tribe in with, through the drag community or the nightclub community? I mean, yes and no. I mean, it's, it's been ongoing and changing ever since, you know, because when you first start going out and you realize there is more people like you, you're not alone. Right. I mean, that's just eye-opening and uh, in uh, I don't even know what I want to say. You do feel part of the group right. all of a sudden. And, um, you know, you make friends and you realize some aren't the best, but then you do really get your core group. You sift through it and you find the ones that really have the same likes and interests as you do. So it does become the second family that we always talk about. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean. I mean, you are, you are a Rochester legend, a superstar. Tell well, us about your you you know you you're 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 being modest. You started out and you went out to the clubs and you saw the queens and quickly before long you became a headliner at Marcella's. Tell us the stories. Well, I can I can share with you this one. I remember going out to one of the clubs and there was a queen. She was tall and thin. Because uh, I didn't think I could get into it. I figured, well, they don't make stuff my size. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're basically a stunt double for Godzilla. Um, but uh, so her name was Venetian Blinds. And mm. that was her name. I, I remember this to this day. And I went up to her and I said, you know, how I admired her and uh, and wondered how she did. She goes, honey, she goes, if I can do it, you can do it. And that stuck in my head like nothing else. And I was like. I am going to do this. I mean, granted, she had the toes hanging over the edge of the shoe, you know, because they were too small. Right. 
And, um, but that was a different time. We didn't have the internet. You had to go out looking locally. And we did have one store. Right. La Belle Grande. Oh. oh this was a shoe store for the uh, plus size woman uh, in the shoe length. The yes. Size. And I picked up, uh, it was on Winton Road, and we, I picked up my first pair of heels. They're probably, I think, $75. I remember this price because it was like monstrous high to me. I thought right. it was like Rob breaking the bank buying these shoes. <laughs> But they were just a simple suede uh, pump, and I was just... You were feeling it. Oh, my Feeling God. the fantasy. <laughs> La Belle Grande. La Belle Grande. Now, so you're performing, and Marcella's. Tell us about what Marcella's was like. I mean, this was a place in Rochester yeah. that was just the main hub at a time when, obviously, pre-RuPaul's Drag Race, pre-all of the internet <laughs> at that point, and uh, you had a, a, a cast of... Uh, the core group, I would say. Yeah. Uh, who, tell us a little bit about who was on that cast and what that was like. Well, I mean, Marcellus was the first club to basically organize the drag shows into a weekly venue. Right. And also develop, you know, a, a level of pay so that these performers could reinvest and keep the show fresh um, and carry it on. Because up to then, it was like, oh, hey, you want to do the show here? You want to do the show here? It wasn't as regimented or... Uh, scheduled is like, yeah, I guess I like a say. cast. And, right, right. It could be, yeah. And so you would do it for tips only at this place because they did it for you when they hosted a show, vice versa. It was kind of give and take. So Marcella's kind of revolutionized it in that sense. And so there was a cast going when I started. Uh, I really kind of came in as a guest performer one night. I remember I got ready for around six o'clock and I didn't go on until about midnight. <laughs> so I was fresh <laughs> wow, as can geez, be. Yeah. Uh, drinking those entire six hours. And, um, but anyway, uh, so I hung around and I kept getting asked back. Uh, and then finally, uh, I don't even remember how long it took, but they uh, said, hey, would you like to become part of the cast here? Right. And that's when it got solidified. Then I started performing on a regular basis. Regular basis, have your own dressing room. Shared dressing room. A shared, okay, yeah. shared dressing room. Yes. What kind of antics went on in the dressing room? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marcella's was a unique venue. I mean, it, it started off, uh, it, it saw all different types of clientele come and go. Uh, the basement is where the uh, dressing rooms were, right. which was basically a fire trap because I think there was only <laughs> one no exit. Right. right, There was one stairwell, which was all rickety, woodety, uh, kind of, you know, broken down. But anyway, uh, yes, it was, the, it was the secondary party scene. Uh, down there for yeah. sure. All the stuff was happening. Yes. All the alcohol, all the drugs, all the things. Let's face the facts. Now that was the time. I moved to Rochester in 99 to open Dial America and I was told by the front desk, you've got to go to Marcella's. Well, I go downtown uh, and with actually the guy from the front desk I became friends with and another one of the gals and it had closed. Yes. And that, it was around <laughs> Halloween. So I was like, oh my gosh. So, you know, I'm coming from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for, and I think I, people were like out of the streets and they were going to Tara's and to other clubs there. And yeah. I was got introduced to a place called Mother's. And uh, I want to say GQ at the time was the dance club. But at Mother's is where I really started to get to know who you were right. as that host. Right. And I just remember, again, the salad bar review on Friday nights, it was the staple show where everybody went to. And you're modest. You're always like, oh, whatever. It, it, it was the show. It was a, quite a successful show. It did. It yeah. went for a long time. I mean, do you remember how many years? Uh, it, I say 10, but it was, I think, a little bit under. Yeah. But it was close to 10. So 10 years there, but all, all total, how many years have you been doing drag? Well, that, I was just thinking about that today, actually, this morning, because I started performing at Marcella's, uh, not as cast, but just kind of those random performances in the summer of 1994. So it'll be 30 years this summer. 30 years. Yes. What, keeps you <laughs> what keeps you going? What keeps you doing it? Why do you keep going? Well, it used to be Stoli and Smirnoff, but um, <laughs> those days have changed. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it really is kind of, um, it, it's an outlet. It's a creative outlet that's lots of fun. Uh, I mean, it's got frustrations for sure. You know, right. there's all sorts of things behind the scenes and, but overall, it, it leaves you with the sense that, you know, when people come up to you and share stories and kind of congratulate you or, or, or relate to you or are inspired by you, it's all 
That's the good stuff. Yes. That's why you keep doing that. Well, that's why we connect. I mean, we connect on multiple different reasons as friends and as fellow performers, but uh, that kindness factor, you <laughs> crack me up. We'll be at a show and Ambrose will be like, okay, so this is Bob and Bob is from Fairport and this is their cousin, Julie. And here's Cynthia. I'm like, who the heck is who? You're so good at that. Now, I think this comes from your customer service background <laughs> over at Black and Blue where you've been- Yeah. Uh, and what is your title? Well, the, the funny executive thing, server. I mean, I'm not sure. You're right. I don't know. What, um, you've been there for a while. I've, yeah, it's, it's been a many. Uh, so I always joke that it actually started back when I worked at Kaufman's. Okay. Yeah, because um, you were always supposed to uh, repeat the customer's name to them after their purchase, after they use their credit card. So you'd look down and then you say thank you, so and so. Right. But half the time you couldn't even pronounce names, and then they'd have those secret shoppers that would come in, and if you remember to use their name you'd get the star on your yeah. name tag oh you're a prestigious well i can't <laughs> believe that i can't believe that you can remember people's names and out of the group of all of us you are the most senile I, of all the queens i mean I, well, tell, tell us a story about horses in la i'm well, linda carter's star no it's a, <laughs> sometimes you know your mind just starts going in different directions that make sense to you but all of a sudden when the mouth moves and comes out it's just alien but no it was very funny we went to uh, it was uh, we went to DragCon. Yes, we and um, LA. I went with you guys and um, Darian and everybody. And um, so, anyhow, I'm a big Linda Carter fan. She had just gotten her star on the Walk of Hollywood. See the Walk of Hollywood, the Walk of Fame, uh, Walk of Fame in Hollywood, <laughs> <laughs> the Walk of California, the Hollywood Walk of Boulevards. Yeah. And um, so, anyway, we finally found it. We almost, we couldn't find it at first, and I was about ready to give up. And you were the one that said, "You know, we're out here." Let's do it because when you know when you're going to be back, yeah, you don't know. So uh, we did finally find it, and <laughs> there was all this like stray straw or something. I don't know where it came from, but I was convinced it was related to horses. <laughs> so I started brushing. My, I'm completely 100 percent sober. Everybody, this is true. Yeah, um, and at I, that time, at that yes. time, yeah. And um, so, uh, <laughs> so I start trying to like brush these random like hairs. I go, there must be horses. And you were just so dumbfounded. Like, what do you mean horses? <laughs> but well, you're sitting there. So we're taking a picture, and you're like, oh, horses, horses. And we're like, what, is she okay? Like. <laughs> Now it was, it was like a Liza lag. Minnelli moment. Yeah, it was, it was it was jet lag, but it was funny. So so now we just joke because random times we'll talk about different things, right. and uh, we all have stand up as a part of our shows. And you'll get right up there and like, does anybody remember Phase Drugs? Oh my gosh, <laughs> you're a retro queen. I do. You, you have such a. Uh, a love and an honor for those times of like the, the yesteryear and you'll bring them into your performances. And a lot of times it'll, it'll shine through when you impersonate different people like Helen Reddy. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that wasn't to be said like that, but it was. I, I We were on the news. Tell the story. Well, I, they were asking like the impersonations and I was just trying to say some artists that I have performed. So I was kind of trying to generate a spectrum. So I said, I do Helen Reddy, but it sounded like I impersonate Helen Reddy. And if you're well, watching the video right now, you're going, she looks nothing, nothing like, like Helen, Helen Reddy. Reddy. <laughs> <laughs> but what was great was, so uh, Helen uh, Reddy on acid, we, maybe, we, I don't know. Local news advertising one of our shows. And the, the reporter was like, knows that Aggie and I do our big wigs impersonation shows right. and asked, are you going to be doing some of your you know, divas like Liza Minnelli and Tina Turner that I have done. And I, ne I never, I always say my Tina Turner is like, if you took Mrs. Kasha Davis impersonating Joy Behar, impersonating Tina Turner. I mean, there's just no spitting image <laughs> happening. It's the essence. It but, is the essence. <laughs> but you just turn and like, well, I'll be doing Helen Reddy. And I am on the news, like pinching my leg. Like I know. <laughs> I think Aggie Dune fell off the couch back at her house. That's right. We were it was, Helen, Helen Ray. <laughs> but this is what we can expect. I am woman, hear me roar. Uh, well, but that's what we can expect. We can hear <laughs> you, songs that you love uh, and you go out and it's a nod to the retro and it's fantastic. Now, when I was coming up, back to Mothers, I remember when I first thought I would like to do drag 
And I said to you, I'd like to do this. And do you remember what your response to me was? I, well, you have repeated it to me. So yes, I remember something about like, uh, well, I can't remember exactly what I said, yeah. but I said something like, be careful. It's very political. It's very political. And I was Get like- Get out while you can. I, <laughs> I was like, what do you mean there's, Repo there, I mean, I'm sure there's Republican uh, drag queens and Democrat drag queens and, and liberal. But I was like, what is happening? What does she mean? So I I think, you know, it, 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 became obvious to me that like any other family or any kind of like group of people, you know, there's going to be a little bit of the, the system where people are trying to make their way up and who's schmoozing who and this, right, that, and the other. Right. I felt when I came into the scene, I think I was such a non-threat that everybody was helping me because my character was different. And yes. I think that was to my advantage, but Truly, as a group, everybody, everybody in the Rochester drag community, what I will always say and what I say when I on interviews and any chance I get, there's a family there where, yes, we'll tease each other and right. tear each other right. and uh, shade, but really we support each other and people are there to lift each other up. No one, I mean, I know we talked about this a little bit. I'm pretty open about, well, pretty, I'm blatantly open about sobriety. Um, we share the, uh, the, the, the love of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and back in the day, I mean, I remember days when we were drinking at mother's and we were, it was a tight, it was tight quarters backstage and you're very tall and I'm very short. We're very Laurel and Hardy. If anybody knows who that is, you know what I mean? And so like, <laughs> and I was standing next to you and we both had too much to drink and you're getting changed and you're like, Boom. Oh, and you just hit me right in the face. And I turned and I was like, ah. and we like had nasty things to say, say to each other. But then it was just, we probably forgot about it two minutes later. But, I still deny this to this day. I oh, deny it, that to it, this day. I don't remember any of because that. Because we were hammered is why. <laughs> <laughs> it was like $40 and six drink tickets. I mean, that was the pay back then. Well, you made more. What, but, more drink tickets? <laughs> maybe. So uh, <laughs> tell us about your, your love and your, your, your relationship uh, with alcohol. Oh, goodness. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think it started, uh, hmm. I think growing up gay... In a time where it was to be ashamed, you didn't speak about it. It was this dark secret. You know, I, I pretty much figured when I grew up, I just would move off and do my own thing and never tell a soul. But, uh, you, you know, to deny your your soul, not your soul existence, but your existence like that, a big part of it uh, is just crippling and, and it, it's bound to come out. Uh, so anyway, I think maybe in those earlier days, I turned to alcohol as maybe that liquid courage. Yeah. Um, also, you know... Because I, I mean, I started drinking in high school. I, actually, I had my first beer in junior high school when I was going to a Kiss concert. Oh, and it's I was Kiss's gonna, fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in the back seat of my uh, best friend's sister, and her boyfriend were driving, and they passed me a beer, and I took once. I thought, how on earth do people drink this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I found a way. Yes. Um, so anyhow, but that was my first sip of the uh, devil's poison. And um, so anyway, uh, but no, I think, you know, maybe in those days, it was like that liquid courage, as I was saying, to fit in, blend in, uh, feel more at ease, comfortable. And it just kind of kept progressing yeah. and progressing and progressing. And for me, I, I always felt like with alcohol, it was, I was always, I was always drunk. And what does that mean? Was I always actively drinking? No. I was thinking about my next drink. I was drinking or hungover. And so there was just this constant obsession where alcohol was just literally like the thing that was always on my mind. And in sobriety and taking that away, there is time for a podcast. There is, there's room yeah. in your head for so much else. And ultimately that is one of the biggest releases for me is to have this freedom in my mind for other things. At the same time, for me, the alcoholism is sometimes comparison, sometimes just that self doubt. Right. Right. And what I have had as a savior, as a connection are people like yourself. I mean, we talk probably every day 
And I know sometimes when I call, you're probably like, there she is again. <laughs> well, I know what time it is when the phone rings. I'm like, oh, it's 1030. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's for me, post meetings. I and I and we connect and we are able to just know that we are not alone, right. that we have that conversation. And it could be about as simple. It could be about, you know, uh, the way that I'm thinking about myself or com- self-comparison or this, that or the other. But it also could be uh, about, you know, oh, my gosh, I these other people at at, at uh, the gig are drinking and how do I make sure that I can do this? How do I fit in? Right. And we've had each other's back. Sure. In that way. And I think that is that next level of community. And I think I, I'm very grateful that I've had you like along the way. I mean, we've, <laughs> that sounds nasty. I've had you, but you know, what I'm, <laughs> I'm a married lady. Uh, well, <laughs> well, not always. Yeah, that's right. But, the, but just, in terms of we had our days when we would joke about the drinks right. and, and when we were both, and then now to be able to look to each other and say, well, if she could do it, I could do it. Right. And like Venetian blinds. That's like Venetian blinds. It all comes back. <laughs> but I do want to just say really quickly, cause I don't know if people know the story, but um, you uh, became sober basically a year before me. Um, and I remember uh, when I had my, uh, well, when I, Finally had to make that decision myself. Um, and it came time to do drag because you asked me to come back and do, I, I was not performing anymore. I had to st- step away from it. And then you invited me back to do a brunch. And I was like, you know, I don't know. This is very triggering. Should I get in drag? Should I do these shows? And da, da, da. And simply that was kind of the thing. You're like, if I can do it, you can do it again. Right. That that same mentality came back for another uh, repeat. And, and, it, we, and it has been successful. And I know some people were very anxious about me stepping back into a pair of tights and heels um, for good reason. Just one pair of tights? <laughs> <laughs> How many layers do you have on right now? Oh, my God. <laughs> Cut me in half and count the rings. Um, so anyway, but yes, yeah, so I, I, I have a lot to thank you for, too. So and here we are now, what, six years brunches and stuff, etc. Yeah, our Drag yeah. Me to Brunch shows are continuing. We've got Drag Me to the Casinos and Drag Me to Brunch and Drag Me to Dinner, dinner and Drag Me on Cruise. We even do Drag Me to Cocktails, but we don't partake. No. And it's fine. I mean, does do you feel, uh, does it trigger you to see people partaking at this point? How no. do you feel? No. Yeah, it's different, right? It's very different. Yeah. No, it's, it's I, I know where I need to be and- that's perfect for me. Right. Same. So I, this is what we take care of right yeah. here. And it, and worst case scenario is that if something should occur, we can reach out to each other and we have other resources where we can reach out. Right. Now you have another obsession. Uh, <laughs> we talked a little bit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> we talked is that a, a, a song from the 80s? Yeah. My obsession? I. Uh, so we talked about phase drugs. We talked about Linda Carter. We've talked about alcohol. Let's talk a little bit about football. Tell us oh what, my God. what's going on. <laughs> this is an intervention. Your drag oh sisters. No, I mean, listen, a lot of people will be like, oh my gosh, gay people or drag queens, they don't like football. You love who? There's the mug. Uh, I do. I love the uh, the Los Angeles Chargers. Not the most popular team living in uh, New York State, uh, but uh, I got into it uh, a little more heavily, basically, um, well, during COVID is when I really started watching it all over again and starting learning more and more. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, now I'm... You're all for it. Now, what, I, I, what draws you in? Is it like the tight ends? Well, What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, everybody loves a good tight end, a big sack, and uh, a strong D. But, you, you know, um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, I don't know. It's uh, It got me hooked, and I uh, fell in love with the players. And granted, there's some cutie patooties out there, too, which is no uh, uh, hindrance for a little eye candy. There you there. go. So, um, now, do you get together with, like, friends or family to watch the game? Oh, yeah, or? of course. And then I even got into, well, you know, speaking of addictions, I did get into fantasy which um, was quite the surprise because when someone told me about fantasy football, I had a whole different idea of what was going to happen. But uh, <laughs> is this where the is this where the football players like dresses Ariel and Ursula, or what happens? No, you just make up your own team and then you battle each other out uh, throughout yeah. the season. It's a then, game within a game. Yes. Okay. So and gambling, then, gambling, well, money's put on the line. I mean, minimal dollars, minimal dollars. <laughs> so now, so. 
do you happen to do you have an interest in in like um, scooters or motorcycles at all? Do you have any interest in those? Well, Batgirl, Batgirl. <laughs> yes, that would be true. You know, back in the day, I remember coming home and you know uh, you see that little Batgirl cartoon come at the end of the Batman show, and you're like, oh my god, it's a great episode. Yeah. Uh, but, who uh, I mean, as little gay boys back then, we wanted to be her. Oh my god, that purple tight suit. <sighs> Like a little cape with the yellow lining. Yeah. Batgirl, she would push that button and the the wall would switch <laughs> yeah. and it would have all her makeup and her costume. And uh, I tried to create that and I turn, I pushed the button and it turned and it turned into Miss Piggy. I tried. <laughs> I mean, I tried. I had a Miss Piggy notebook in grade school. So, um, yeah. And she wrote a motorcycle too, believe it or not. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. The great you know? Muppet caper. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, it was something I always wanted when I was a teenager. The 80s, again, back in the day, Grace Jones, uh, Devo, they did those commercials for those Honda scooters. And uh, I always wanted one. And I never did. And then again, with my sobriety, I started to th- uh, say, I'm going to take advantage of things that I let slide from before. And I never got my... Uh, motorcycle license because I just didn't pursue it. I was always, I don't know, busy, not always drunk, but almost. And um, <laughs> so I decided since I was no longer spending money on uh, alcohol and drugs, I was going to buy a motorcycle yeah. and scooters. And so 30 odd years later, I got one of those red Hondas that Grace Jones had back in 1984. It's so cool. And uh, and I had a couple others on top of it. Yeah. So, yeah. No. Well, Mr. Davis is right now Googling or going to your Instagram and showing pictures of those scooters. They're so cool. <laughs> and it's so fun. And again, it goes right along with the whole idea of retro ambrosia salad and just it's just fantastic well i am so grateful that you are here i'm so grateful that you uh took the time to share some stories with us and a little bit of fun uh what i like to do at the end of our 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 time and and more to come i mean drag me to anything i mean we've got brunches we got cruise ships we got dinners and we're going to be doing all kinds of shows and have a lot to say about it and stand-up comedy i mean stand-up comedy (laughs) yes (laughs) could you even believe it I, it's again, been, something I never would have thought I'd be at doing uh, standing on stages in comedy clubs in uh, in Rochester and even outside of Rochester yeah. now. So more to come. Uh-huh. We're having a lot of fun. So I like to end my show, our show, our time together with some dad jokes. I do it randomly. So I'm going to I can start first. Uh, how many apples grow on a tree? How many apples grow on a tree? All of them. Uh, <laughs> okay, your turn. Ah, uh, this this one's from my memory. I think uh, okay. it's been very popular. Ah, uh, how come you can't hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? How come? Because their pee is silent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, here's one for us. How do inmates call each other? Toodaloo. <laughs> they use cell phones. Uh, Oh my God. <laughs> Gagging over here. I love a bad joke. I love a dad joke. I love a bad joke. Even better. Wait, what did, where's the. Um... It could okay. be the answer could be on the back or on the bottom. Well, it's, it's always about the bottom with the. <laughs> well, this will be, this almost comes in play with you. All right. Um, how does a cucumber become a pickle? <gasps> how? Uh. Oh, it goes through a jarring experience. <laughs> I <didn't... laughs> uh, hopefully we can add in there. Boom, 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 well, boom, boom. I, I'm having problem as, as I'm, you know, I know I'm looking 21 on the monitors and everything else around here, but I am getting a little bit older and uh, my eyes are starting to go. So that's why all of a sudden I could not read this. She didn't have her readers. She needed her bifocals. She needed a magnifying glass. You know, yeah, the old, yeah. Um, oh my gosh. More to come with Ambrosia oh Salad. And what I want to say is thank you for tuning in to another podcast of Auntie. We're having so much fun. I hope you're enjoying, you're listening, you're sharing. And if you are around Rock Box Studios, we just have a hoot here. It's just fantastic. It's gorgeous. Candles, candles burning. Yes, it is so much fun. And remember, when you're in doubt, remember this. There's always time for kindness. Until next time. Woo!